for coming in. Um, Emily was born in Connecticut and now in Taffer, aren't we lucky? And uh, she has a Master of Arts mm -hmm. in Art Therapy. Yeah. Um, amazingly, she has studied uh, under five different art professors at four different college levels. So she has a huge Oops, amount of experience to bring with us today. Um, she's a perfect painter. She's been teaching art classes at community colleges in the Bay Area and does all kinds of things here in Napa as well. Um, she also uh, does art therapy with people with disabilities. So that's kind of a side thing for her. And she works mainly in acrylic, oil, watercolor, abstract, too bad. Very <laughs> focus. Um, and she works landscapes, floral, still life, and abstract. So um, we're happy to see her energy here and turn it over to you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, thank you, Sharon. I worked at, Michael is doing <clears throat> two hour, two and a half hour um, painting lessons. And I'm going to show you um, the process that I went through uh, in doing one of these types of paintings. But before that, I just wanted to show you some of the lesson plans that Sue might be, <laughs> Sue might recognize uh, that uh, I may have taught her. So. I'm doing flashes of from the photo. We work from photos, so from photo to painting. And these are these are mine. Without ado, let's see we'll run. At the same time I'm testing our, our technology. <laughs> <laughs> Lives, landscapes, and seascapes. <clears throat> and today I'm going to be doing <coughs> a landscape. This is a <clears throat> photo that I took from Sonoma about 10 or 15 years ago. Could you speak up a little louder for me? Okay, Thanks. and you can turn the volume down now, all the way down. Turn the volume down on your. Okay. So. Um, so anyway, the color palette that I used <clears throat> is up here. I used ultramarine blues, uh, cerulean blue, a touch of phthalo blue, white, um, and the reds I used are alizarin crimson, cadmium, alizarin uh, crimson, cadmium, red, uh, light, Grumbacher red. Hooper's green, cad yellow medium, cad yellow light, and it's sort of a limited palette. Um, when I was working with Michaels, I was working with Rumbacker also, and they had to approve me for lesson plans, and so I used all their paints, and uh, so did my students for most of the time. So <clears throat> I'm going to start with. The sky. <coughs> so if you have any questions, go ahead and ask. Well, I'm setting up my palette. The sky is going to be done in a wash. And um, then there's a wiping off technique. So do you usually start from the back and move forward? That's right, yes. From the back to the front and from dark to light with acrylics. You can do that with watercolors or no. possibly any other medium. Do you always paint on a white canvas? <clears throat> Pardon? Do you always paint on a white canvas? I'm going to do half the sky and then I'm going to paint the over the canvas. Do you always start with white or do you ever have it be black or blue or something underneath? No, not unless, well, I, I do a background, but I start with a white canvas. Okay, that's what I asked. Yeah. But I might, I, admit, I might mix a background color for part of it. And sometimes, Sue will tell you, sometimes when I did this one, I would lay down this very dark 
you know, blackish green. And Grumbacker always taught me to make my own blacks, not to use black out of the tube for, for color harmony. a little bit of ultramarine blue and a little of cerulean blue and just a touch of phthalo blue. <laughs> and actually I'm going to have to lay it down because it will drip. I also use a hair dryer to uh, dry in between. And uh, you know one of the rules of painting is that you don't cut a painting in half. So my line is going to be a little bit above that, so I'm not sure if you'll be able to see this or not. But when I'm done, I'll put it up. So it's, this is going to be about 60% land and about 40% sky. And usually, I always work in this size with my students, but today I'll I thought I would uh, work larger so that you can see it better. <clears throat> How many of you work in acrylics? Does any, anyone here work in acrylics? Mm -hmm. What do you like or not like about it? It dries, it dries, it dries fast. fast. I'm watching the squirt bottles, I know. Yes. <laughs> it does. I'm going to intensify the colors in the sky, the upper left, in the upper left area, and that will be more phthalo blue. Phthalo blue. Do you ever use open acrylics and golden? Do you ever use open acrylics from golden? I have some golden. Do you like that? I'm just it's I'm just in the habit of using Rombacker because I can I know what their tones are and yeah. I'm used to them. Yeah, right. so I try to stick with with one type, you know, one type of one brand. Yeah, and that's important too when I'm teaching because if people come in with different brands, like the the colors, the colors will be off. You know, mm -hmm. it just won't quite be the same. So, and only do you paint the sides so that it, it can be unframed, or do you frame them? <clears throat> I I can paint the sides sometimes. What do you normally do? Um, normally frame them. Usually, all my acrylics are 36 by 48, and yes, I do paint the sides. Yeah. I have a couple of them on mm -hmm. uh, framed. <coughs> today I'm not going to do, today I won't do that though. Alright, so. So I'm going to take my cloth, and first I'm going to Fade the edge out. Dab off some of the paint. Some of them 
look different than other ones. Mm -hmm. Like there might there might be more purples in one or more greens in the other. And I wasn't going to show it, but I actually already did. I have a finished piece. So. That was quick. <laughs> that was done. <laughs> so I'm going to put that here because that might be helping. I just want to look at it somewhere. And I had originally had a, I was going to show you the steps I took um, to do the painting, but hopefully I will have enough time to do all the steps. And if not, I can show you, uh, I have it on up there that, that we can show. Then I took, um, I'm going to let this dry a little bit, and that's why I brought the hair dryer. It wasn't really handy. Keeping it wet. I haven't taught this one yet. This is a brand new one for me. Then it's good to step back and see what we've done. Feels like a new 
shades of light down in here. Pull off some color. Mm -hmm. And if the color is dry, then it won't pull off. You can wet the rag and pull it off. I do consider these paintings more color studies than, than finished paintings because they don't take that long to do and there's not a whole lot of detail in them. But they're a great study for um, color harmony. So, you know, if you want to take time later on and go in and do a lot of detail, like some people like to do. <coughs> and that's a nice thing to do. Okay, again, I'm going to dry it. There's a great deal of texture in the sky. And I'm going to take a little bit of white because I want to lighten up the clouds a little bit. And in order to avoid um, any lines, I'll use this brush again to kind of scumble in. <coughs> The background, <clears throat> the the lands. I start out with a ultramarine blue. Pretty much, I use blues, greens, and reds to make a very dark, kind of a reddish color. So I'm probably going to use a couple of tablespoons at least of paint. The, um, the reds, uh, the crimson will be primary. I'll probably use a little cat red light in there too. They also have a Grumbacker red. Which actually, uh, I didn't, when I, um, let's see, I think it was uh, Still Lifes. There are certain palettes that I was um, taught to use for landscapes versus seascapes versus Still Lifes. 
chrome back of ridges. One of those colors. So, and hooker's green. Let's see what we get. So what I'm going for is a, is a reddish, really a dark reddish black background. That's a little purple. So I'm going to add some grown back real red. To, keep, to get the purple out, I'm going to add Cooper's Green. teaching they <clears throat> recommended the filbert brush and a small brush like this and this horrible palette knife that I just uh, did, refused to use so I use a I use one that's bendable it's much easier it's a smaller bendable. do you just use water you don't use any acrylic medium when you mix your paints no I no that's not how they wanted me to teach and it gets a little bit complicated because then you get into transparencies and I'm not going to do that here. I'm not going to do that here today. It's fun to experiment with all that. Well, why not add some brown? Pardon? Why don't you just add some brown? Because it's more fun to learn how to do brown. <laughs> <laughs> also, to harmonize the colors. No, not, not in this case. Um, in um, still lifes, they taught me to use browns. But for those landscapes, they wanted me to teach people how to mix the browns. So that you know what goes into them. And, and if you're using those colors, in the painting, they will be, you know, your your eye will pick them up. So, harmonization. So the yellow gives it a little bit more, in my mind, stability. <clears throat> That's the color. And it's interesting because you know I may have taught something three or four times, and every one of them comes out different, a little bit different. So we can attest to that, right? <laughs> Go ahead and make a comment about it. Any anything that you it's remember? Just it's just funny watching you do it again. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think mixing the colors was the most challenging. Is is getting the color that you want. Mm -hmm. It seems like you spend half your time mixing. <laughs> Yeah, and then if you don't get it, then you have too much, and then you have, you know, and I have to teach them to take a little bit of this and add a little bit more, and yeah, this is just very time consuming. It's easier to just go and find some brown. Yeah. But do you think you have But you don't learn anything that way. 
Yeah, so raw umber in the purple looks works pretty well. Yeah. You think you have more control when you know <coughs> the colors out of more control. Control. control of your result? Well, more color harmony control, I mm -hmm. would say. When you, when you mix the color, when you mix the brown yourself. <coughs> Take your brush and hold it horizontally so that you don't get these streaks. But if you get streaks, you can dry it and then you can do a second coat if you like. It's amazing how much you know how, how different something comes out depending on the way you hold the brush. Every time I want to cook, then I'll like kind of scrubbing it. Is that true? <laughs> Just trying to cover the whole canvas? Or? Are you saying that you think that I'm doing that? Or well, we start that way. Now you're doing more smoothly. Yeah, because I want to cover. I want to cover the canvas now with one color, and I don't want it to streak. So you get these little streaks here. Is this in the way? By the way. I can see. Is this in the way for anyone else? canvas and then it just it's a mess so drying is kind of an important step with acrylics for me
about the tree and the horizon line. say that what works is the right brush for the right job. So this is called a rudder brush. What is it called? Rudder, R-U-D-D-E-R, -D -D -E rudder brush. Okay. Got all sizes and all shapes. How is that different than a liner brush? Probably the same. Well, thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> this one's called Script. I guess maybe different companies have different names for them. They have short ones, like here's a short, short rudder brush. Around. Mm -hmm. uh, here's, here's the tallest one. But I'm going to try to get one that has a good point on it. Are they fairly stiff? Those Pardon? Are they fairly stiff? Yeah. No. Well, this one is probably the stiffest. This is the oldest. Somewhat. Somewhat. Um, I think I bought this one at, um, I don't really know where, but maybe Michael Simply Simmons Round number two. This one's a little longer. This is a one. And it's called, it says it's a script brush. Oh, yeah. One thing that I was taught to taught my student, teach my students is don't leave your, <laughs> don't leave your brushes in the water because they were there. So far away, you want them to look fuzzy, really fuzzy and white. I'll start out with that dark background color and then add some highlights of reds and yellows. So to make sure that it's opaque enough, I would take more paint and kind of cover it so that it blends in with the rest of the foreground. So there's not a line there.
put a little bit of paint on with, with a bit of water. And uh, like this. Give it a little bit of a lightness. growing things. <clears throat> On the monitor, it looks like there are birds flying. Yeah, we're getting oh, yeah. some for, um, <laughs> artifacts of some sort. <laughs> There's some interference here somewhere. Right. Right. It's, it's not the same over there, is it? What's yeah. Live painting. Now the tree uh, looks different than the uh, photograph. It's, the photograph made it look very heavy and dense, but I accentuated the branches. I used a couple. I used a dark color and then some light colors up top. Oh, before I do that, we're just like mm -hmm. before I do that, I'm gonna take some Grumbacker red and a little yellow, do some highlights in here. So that it looks less like a silhouette and, and more like there's a tiny bit of light left. Mm -hmm. Of course, if I put too much on, I can just go a little bit with the darker color. And scum it in. <laughs> and maybe even just a bit of hooker's green. You can hardly even see that color, but your eye will pick it up. <clears throat> so of course we want it off-center. And it's kind of tricky because I want to delineate the edges of the tree because they're so nice. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't want to be too heavy with it, so I'm going to try and to give, give myself an idea of how much sky I want to have above the tree, how large the tree is. And like I said, almost every painting comes out a little different. So 
I guess you would say that my style is a bit impressionistic. It's not, it's not um, anywhere near realistic. Okay, so I've got the edges outlined, or at least set in my mind as to <clears throat> how large I want that tree. Then I'll go back in with <clears throat> the liner brush. And uh, just keep adding branches. <clears throat> Oops, moving them. You need to keep the paints fairly wet. Not terribly wet, because it would be too transparent, but just wet enough so that you have it's just it comes with experience on how wet, wet it should be. Because if it's too dry, it'll come out clumpy mm -hmm. and too thick. So that's something that someone has to experiment with. See the trunks here, but I'm I'm guessing that this old oak is going to have a lot of curviness to the trunks, and they're not going to be straight. So I'm going to add some character to it. And the branches kind of, they feel like they, they're like an umbrella and they kind of go down to the ground. Use this now. Mm -hmm. Can 
This is like the dead of winter, I believe. This, this tree doesn't really have any leaves on it. It's just a lot of branches. Or if, if it's leaves, you can't really see them. It's kind of far away. Is that mustard? Yeah, the picture. Is that it's this is mustard mark. field. Yeah, yeah and that's a very much. old oak tree. I'm trying to remember the name of the road it's on. When you go into Sonoma, you go past like Napa Road. Oh, you take Napa Road and no, it's saying no. No, you actually go, no, you don't go take Napa Road. Arnold? Yeah, it's the road that takes you to Safeway, you know, on the right. Mm. There's a huge field, and now it's all cut down and it's used for something else. Mm -hmm. Almost time? Yeah, a minute. So, Emily, will you add green to that when we're done? I will, a little bit. Are you talking about the tree? Yeah. Yes, I, I probably will. Although I did not do that in this painting. But I could. Looks like there's a little green in the photo. Yeah, there's green in the photo. Of course, you know, I've taken artistic license. Mm -hmm. So. But let's see what happens if I add a little green. I'm going to add a little yellow to the green. And I kind of like the whole concept of, of you know working from foundations and working layers upon layers. It's kind of 
gives me a nice feel, it helps me feel that the medium is something that I could control and handle and actually repeat when I'm teaching. It's like a yellow ochre. I used uh, cad yellow medium, cad yellow white, and some of that background color, which has pretty much all the colors in it. So. But, but uh, primarily yellows. And it's good to think about stems too. Like the direction of the stems. to do is look for patterns like there's a shape right there made by the blossoms. There's a line almost like a line right there. Pattern. Nature loves patterns. But you could use your artist license and put them anywhere you feel like. You could. Sure. <laughs> Is that your style? Whatever. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> well, I, I think the way you're doing it is very um, academic because you're teaching us how to see. Absolutely. Right, I see patterns. Yeah. And how to That's create good. that 
what you're seeing. That's what interests me. Not that I would paint realistically like that, but those techniques can be used in anything. Great. Are you an abstract artist? Yeah. I do abstracts too. I mean, I actually prefer abstracts, but I, I don't teach abstracts. Yeah. I don't teach. <clears throat> There's not a big, huge call for <laughs> abstract teachers. There were. But you use the same, you know, you use the same structures, the same ideas. Uh, whether it's abstract, I mean, there's value, color, composition, composition. feeling, movement, depth. Oh, all, the rule, all the same rules apply, it's just the, the subject matter is different. <laughs> And you want to vary the sizes too. Of course, what's what's closest to you is going to be the large, be the large largest, and then these are smaller as you go farther away. My teacher used to say, "Look at your thumb. Pardon? Look at your thumb. Your thumb is in focus. Anything behind your thumb, you can't." And it helps. <clears throat> Lots of green in the foreground. I'm going to start putting that in, starting with a dark green. But I'm going to gray it out with other colors. I'll never use anything right out of the tube. So I add a little bit of cadmium red light to the green.
use this brush, the fill dye. shape with the round brush. So it looks more like that, you know, around the flowers. Around the shape of the flowers. And there's a lot of really dark color in there, but it's mostly hooker's green with a little bit of red. Let's see what that looks like. It's not quite dark enough, so I'm going to just take some pure hooker's green. If you work for Brumbacher to teach the classes, did they buy the paints? I just wondered if they wanted you to be specific with the type of paint if they bought it for you. Yes. For your classes. That would be lovely. But I've just kind of fallen in love with Brumbacher. I just, I'm used to it, so I use it Absolutely. even though I'm not teaching there anymore. You know, I teach on my own and I still use Brumbacher. So I'm, you know, bringing some of this dark green all the way down to the front foreground. Going around the flowers that I sketched in. Is Hooker's a real shiny green? Is it one of them? No. Really, really shiny? Mm -hmm. No, I wouldn't say. That, that's it right out of the tube. No, I don't think it, I don't, wouldn't necessarily think it's shiny. No, there's either Hooker's or Sap or one of those that I use in Hoyas. Much shinier than anything else. Mm -hmm. 
pretty much all of these colors are matte. Fastest excellent vehicle for our emotions. Let me see if it says anything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Resistance mm -hmm. excellent. Yeah. I mean, it's not one of these. Some of so the different kinds now. Yeah. Yeah. Liquid and heavy. And, mm -hmm. It doesn't really say, but I would say it's a medium body. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, some of the colors are pretty opaque and some are very transparent. What's that? I was saying that it's interesting to me to watch the undulation, but also the different levels that you're accomplishing right now. And is that because you already put the large <coughs> yellow pieces on? You mean the the flowers? Yeah, the individual it's flowers themselves. Perspective. Yeah. The perspective is coming. Probably, yes. Yeah, it's yeah. really neat. So. Yeah. Watch That's the evolution. So yes. Because the tree and everything is foreshortened, so you've got good perspective. I know you're all dying and waiting for the mustard colors. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I am. I know. <laughs> What's our time? What's the time frame? Is it until 3? Or I have like. Like 14 minutes. Uh -huh. I may not finish. 13 and no pressure. <laughs> Probably won't get to the No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> for the mustard here. He's trying to distract us. <laughs> 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 I knew I wouldn't finish. Okay, so this is a really old brush that I'm going to use to start putting in the actual mustard colors now. There's at least <laughs> three, three shades, you know, that, um, that'll, that'll go on here and I'll start with a darker and go to the lighter. And there's a bit of, there's quite a bit of reddishness in here. Mm -hmm. So, cadmium yellow medium. Um, with a bit of cad red light. And because it's in the background, I'm going to add a little bit of green. 
So it's going to be lighter than this color, but not in the lightest color yet. It's, it's, it's a layer of thing. line terribly perfectly smooth. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a little rough and bumpy because of the umbels are sticking up. Again when I put this paint on I want to make sure that some of the background and the under colors are coming through. Along with Mm -hmm. color now. So I'm going to put some of that red in some places, not everywhere. to squint down a little bit for value. <clears throat> also, if you want to know if you're on track with color, <clears throat> I think I learned this in art school, you just hold your hand like this and look at an area and then look at the photograph and see if they're similar. So in order to not get lines, using this type of brush, I'm going to try and keep turning it. So it's, it's more um, very... And I could actually, once I get this done, I can switch to a, small, a little bit smaller brush. As I come forward, I want to switch to a brush like this because we're getting closer to the foreground and things are becoming more individual and a little bit larger. And for this method, you want to roll your brush into the paint and then 
put a lot of it on the tip. So again, I'm starting out with kind of this golden mustard color. And then I will go over that with um, that on cadmium yellow medium and then cadmium yellow light. Mm -hmm. Have any of you ever painted mustard? dry it because the green, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but because the green is mixing with the yellow. Actually, maybe I'll leave it because there is a little bit of green in that. <clears throat> Certainly not, it's not too bad. Now, this, um, <clears throat> the light is coming from this way. So the lightest sides are on the left. So since we're running out of time, I'll try and maybe do a particular area. I'll focus on this area. Putting down the darker yellows. Um, maybe drying a few. Then going over it with truer colors, lighter colors. The stems are kind of a yellow green. And I'm going to keep the, use the liner brush. <coughs>
putting um, lighter greens in the foreground for the grasses on top like this. And, and um, <clears throat> trying to delineate some leaves and stems. So pure cad yellow medium.